Welcome to my channel. This is Captain Binoy Varagil, Assistant Professor, Department of English, St. Joseph Kola Dev Grikol Kod Kerala. We discuss the poetics of Aristotle and this is the second lecture in this series. We had uh, the first lecture the other day and in the first lecture we looked at the biography details and uh, chapters 1 to uh, one and three, uh, one and two of uh, the poetics, and in chapter one we discuss the media of poetic imitation, and uh, chapter two we discussed objects of uh, poetic imitation. Today we look at uh, chapter three, and the chapter three is titled "The Manner of Poetic." imitation the manner of poetic imitation and uh, let us uh, discuss what uh, Aristotle says about the manner of poetic imitation in this chapter the manner of uh, poetic imitation uh, in the beginning of the uh, chapter uh, in paragraph 1 Aristotle mentions the three ways of narration there are three ways of narration and uh, uh, number one a poet can imitate either through narration in which he takes another personality an omniscient eye watching the events like an observer and, and this is the first way of narration and uh, for example we see this kind of narration in Homer. This is the omniscient eye is the narration style in Homer. And the second narration is a poet can speak in his own person unchanged. And that is the first person I. So the second narration is the first person I. And the third a poet can present all his characters as living and moving in front of us, in front of uh, the uh, spectators or in front of the readers. And this is the third person narration, the third person narration or the third person narrator. And uh, that now chapter 3, second section, Aristotle speaks about the three factors by which the imitative arts are differentiated and uh, they are the three factors by which the imitative arts are differentiated are number one their media number two the objects and uh, the, the objects they represent and number three their manner of presentation so uh, these are the three uh, factors by which the imitative actors, uh, arts are imitative arts are differentiated. Number one, the media of uh, uh, representation, and uh, that is of course whether it is uh, color, sound, or letters, their media. And number two, the objects they represent. So what is being represented the object of uh, the representation and uh, number three the manner of representation how it is uh, represented and uh, we have examples in this chapter about the uh, three factors of uh, uh, the uh, imitative arts and uh, uh, we hear about Aristotle speaks about Sophocles and Homer so, Focals, we know that uh, the great uh, tra uh, tragic playwright and we have the great uh, epic writer Homer says, so, according to Aristotle, Sophocles and Homer are men of the same kind as imitators because both of them represent good men. So, the object of the representation in Sophocles and Homer are good men so uh, that is 
we are just uh, Aristotle is just elaborating the three factors by which the imitative arts are differentiated number one they are media number two the objects they represent and number uh, three the manner of representation and uh, as a continuation of this point Aristotle says that Sophocles and Homer represent the good men okay so the, so the object of representation of men in action in Sophocles and Homer are men of uh, the uh, same uh, 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 that is of course good men all right and now when we look at uh, Aristophanes Aristophanes is also like Sophocles because Aristo Aristophanes also represent men in action men actually doing things and and uh, the the kind of arts that represent men in action according to Aristotle are drama so the uh, works of the works of Aristophanes and Sophocles are uh, drama because they represent men in action and uh, uh, for this uh, for their works for the works of Aristophanes and Sophocles uh, they represent men doing things so men in action and men doing things so in the last part of book chapter 3 of uh, uh, the poetics Aristotle speaks about where the place where in 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 Greece drama just uh, uh, began okay or rather where uh, in in which part of Greece drama drama just originated and he there are different opinions or rather Aristotle is mentioning different places like uh, he speaks about Dorians d-o-r-i-a-n-s Dorians and he also speaks about another uh, uh, place or another uh, province which is the Megarians in Greece M-E-G-A-R-I-A-N-S Megarians and uh, uh, that we have also another place Sicily and uh, we have uh, another place Peloponnese P-E-L-O-P-O-N-N-E-S-E -E. so these are all different places in uh, ancient Greece and the credit for the uh, performance of uh, drama especially we have tragedy comedy so the credit for uh, the invention of tragedy and comedy is of course given to different uh, people in different places in Greece and uh, Aristotle is of the opinion that Dorians claim the invention of both tragedy and comedy on one side Aristotle says that and besides in, 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 an, in another uh, occasion he says that comedy is claimed by the Megarians as well as the people of Sicily so we have Megaria in Greece we have Sicily in uh, Greece and uh, Aristotle says that the comedy is claimed by both these people in Greece uh, the Megarians as well as Sicily as people in Sicily claim the credit for inventing comedy so initially we are told that tragedy and comedy are claimed by Dorians they say that they have invented but subsequently Aristotle speaks to us that the Megarians and the people of Sicily uh, claim the invention of comedy and uh, we also see that we have uh, the people of Peloponnese, right? Peloponnese is a place in Athens. So tragedy is also uh, claimed by the people, uh, the, the Peloponnese, okay? And uh, uh, these are the very, uh, these are the facts we uh, read about in uh, the chapter three of the poetics okay the manner of poetic imitation then the three ways of narration and last part of the chapter the people 
or who invented uh, uh, tragedy and, and, and comedy okay and now we move on to chapter 4 chapter 4 is uh, titled the origins and development of poetry okay and uh, uh, here uh, this is of course uh, rather uh, a bigger chapter a longer chapter and in this chapter Aristotle speaks to us about in, in the initial part of the chapter as we as you see in the uh, slide Aristotle speaks to us about the very causes for the creation of poetry the causes for the creation of poetry okay so according to Aristotle the creation of poetry generally is due to two causes and what are the two causes which are uh, 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 which which lead to the creation of poetry okay number one it is the human instinct to imitate it is because of the human instinct to imitate that uh, uh, poetry is invented or poetry is made and number two the uh, uh, second reason is of course right uh, the instinct for harmony and rhythm men have human beings have an instinct for harmony and rhythm it is that instinct for harmony and rhythm that leads to the invention of poetry in short we can consolidate the fact that the creation of poetry is generally due to uh, two causes the human instinct to imitate and the instinct for harmony and rhythm and uh, uh, after that uh, Aristotle speaks to us about the very uh, uh, development of poetry into two directions so right now poetry just uh, 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 developed because of or, uh, the, the very uh, instinct of human instinct to imitate and of course the human instinct for harmony and rhythm once poetry has uh, uh, developed it is just uh, evolving in two directions and uh, uh, he speaks about the two directions into which the poetry uh, developed the one uh, group of poems imitated the noble actions or the actions of good men so there are two types of poetry and uh, one group of poetry is imitating or presenting noble actions of good men and that poetry which uh, represented or imitated noble actions of good men became what is known as uh, 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 the very uh, epic poetry okay so the epic poetry poetry emerged and evolved into two directions one side the epic poetry and epic poetry is poetry that uh, represent or imitate noble actions of uh, good men and uh, later from uh, as, as drama developed okay uh, uh, Aeschylus and other dramatists just uh, uh, represented or imitated like in poetry noble actions of good men in drama and uh, that ultimately became tragedy so in short we can understand that poetry evolved in two directions initially we have epic poetry and epic poetry from epic poetry developed tragedy say for example Aeschylus and others right and Aeschylus in fact uh, uh, introduced characters into uh, the drama and of course initially we had uh, single character dramas thereafter we have uh, uh, the increase of uh, number of characters say for example the drama is slowly slowly uh, developing right we we study drama and uh, the very uh, in, in in our discussion of the theory of drama in detail we understand about the choric singers 
uh, around the very statue of uh, goddess Dionysus and of course uh, the very movement of the calling singers into the the right the left and of course uh, standing still strophe and dystrophe and a pod and uh, from this practice of uh, the uh, festival of uh, the Dionysus goddess we have the development of drama and uh, slowly characters uh, besides the char choric singers characters are also introduced and uh, single character uh, in was introduced besides the choric singers by uh, Aeschylus and thereafter the number of characters go in went increasing and uh, it was of course Sophocles who introduced uh, uh, three uh, actors into the very drama okay so uh, let us continue our discussion of chapter 4 the origins and development of poetry uh, and, and as, as epic poetry uh, evolved uh, we have in the other direction the the de development of satiric poetry and what is satiric poetry satiric poetry is a kind of poetry that imitate uh, 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 the actions of meaner persons and the actions of simple trivial people okay uh, insignificant people is uh, represented in uh, satiric poetry and slowly slowly from satiric poetry developed uh, uh, comedy all right so this is the gist of uh, chapter four so one side we can see there are two divisions or two directions two kinds of poetry epic poetry and satiric poetry epic poetry is representing noble actions of good men the other side we have satiric poetry satiric poetry is representing the actions of meaner uh, people lower people trivial silly people and uh, yeah uh, uh, satiric poetry uh, is rather funny it is satire it is in in the form of satire and epic poetry is about uh, great people noble people great action and uh, from epic poetry developed tragedy and from satiric poetry developed uh, uh, satire and uh, comedy all right so with that we come to the end of the discussion of chapter four and now we move on to the discussion of uh, chapter five chapter five is title rise of comedy epic compared with tragedy so in this chapter chapter five Aristotle speaks to us in detail about the uh, origin and development of uh, uh, comedy and uh, he also speaks to us about the differences among uh, epic and uh, tragedy. What is the difference between epic poetry and tragedy? Okay, this is just an initial lecture on the uh, two types like uh, epic poetry as well as uh, tragedy right let's look at uh, the very initial uh, part of uh, the chapter okay initially Aristotle speaks to us about uh, the very yeah we know that comedy r result from uh, uh, satiric poetry so he says that comedy began as an imitation of characters of lower type meaning a representation of a defeat or ugliness in character which is not painful or destructive so this is very very important what is comedy or how did comedy begin begin comedy began as an initial imitation of characters of lower type okay uh, in, in in tragedy we see uh, aristocratic uh, members of the society like uh, maybe knights lords uh, kings queens all right so comedy began as an imitation of characters of lower type representation of uh, a defeat or ugliness in the character and uh, their action 
they, their action do not or rather doesn't uh, lead to pain or, uh, or, or, or distraction. And comedy was at first not taken seriously. But once plot was introduced in Sicily, comedic theatre, there was of course a comedic theatre in Sicily, uh, uh, it, it, it just, the, uh, as, as plot was introduced in the comedic theatres of Sicily, comedy soon grew into a respected form. So this is about the development of comedy. We know that it is the imitation of lower type of characters. It's about the defeat or ugliness of uh, uh, these uh, uh, characters. And uh, these, this kind of play, play, uh, plays do not lead to any kind of catharsis or, or, or there is no pity or, or, or fear. But here uh, it is just fun in, in comedy. And uh, uh, it, it was just... Uh, uh, the, the initially there weren't any in, any kind of plot, but slowly, slowly, plot was introduced in the comedic theatre of Sicily, and from that stage later comedy respected, uh, I mean, developed into, of course, a respected form. These are uh, the very ideas um, Aristotle speak to us about uh, uh, the rise of comedy and in the second part of the chapter Aristotle speaks to us about the epic poetry and he tells us uh, uh, in fact uh, uh, that epic poetry is also known as heroic poem and uh, he tells us what is epic poetry uh, say for example according to Aristotle epic poetry or heroic poem. A heroic poem is uh, applied to or the, the very term epic or heroic poem is applied to a long narrative on a serious subject told in a formal and elevated style and uh, uh, it is of course centered on a heroic or quasi divine figure on which actions depends on on whose act yeah, on whose actions depends on depends the fate of a tribe, a nation, or the human race, uh, etc. That's the definition of epic or heroic poem. And according to Aristotle, Aristotle in the second part of this chapter tells us that epic poetry, like tragedy, imitates men of noble action. We saw it some time ago in chapter uh, uh, four. Okay, so epic poetry, like tragedy, imitates men of noble action. Epic poetry only allows one kind of meter and is narrative in form. So this is about the diction and style of epic poetry. Just one kind of uh, meter and uh, uh, also we have just... Uh, uh, narrative structure, epic poetry is in narration, the, st the, 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 the style or the structure, okay, it is not meant for performance, it is just for narration. Moreover, tragedy usually confines to a single day. This is important. So the uh, uh, action or, or the time of tragedy is uh, just limited to a single revolution of the sun that is of course a single day whereas epic poetry has no limits of time it could be about a uh, maybe maybe hundreds of years it could be about centuries it could be about an epoch it could be about maybe a, 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 a thousands of years so this is very important so this is the major uh, difference or contrast between epic and tragedy uh, Aristotle's, Aristotle's, Aristotle's speak about in this chapter. A tragedy usually confines to a single day or single revolution of uh, the sun whereas epic poetry is uh, uh, limitless so far as time is concerned and uh, he also tells us that uh, all the elements of an epic poem are found in tragedy. 
but not all the elements of tragedy are found in an epic poem. This is very important. So, according to Aristotle, all the elements of an epic poem are found in tragedy, but not all the elements of tragedy are found in an epic poem. And uh, uh, in the subsequent chapters, like uh, chapters 6 uh, and 7 and all, he speaks to us in detail about tragedy. So, now he tells us, uh, in chapter 5, he tells us the difference between epic poetry and tragedy. And he tells, uh, uh, of course, that uh, epic poetry is uh, uh, using a specific meter and uh, thereafter he says that it is just narrative but uh, uh, sec later it tells that uh, 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 tragedy is of course uh, different from epic poetry because tragedy uh, all the elements of tragedy are not found in epic poetry all right with that he concludes chapter uh, five and now we move on to chapter six this chapter is very important because in it we we come across the very des definition of tragedy and uh, uh, this this is a chapter in which Aristotle very seriously speaks to uh, speak to us about definition of tragedy and uh, the different parts of tragedy okay let's look at uh, the very uh, description of tragedy the chapter in fact begins with uh, a, a definition of tragedy so the very description or very definition of tragedy we see in the poetics uh, of Aristotle is uh, given in the uh, monitor uh, the slide look at that a, a tragedy is a representation of an action that is worth serious attention complete in itself and of some amplitude in language enriched by a variety of artistic devices appropriate to the several parts of the play presented in the form of action not narration by means of pity and fear bringing about the purgation of such emotions this is the very famous definition of uh, tragedy by aristotle uh, the chapter opens with uh, such uh, these these are the very words we see in the opening of chapter 6 of uh, the poetics uh, of aristotle and uh, look at that it is the representation of an action what is drama about what is tragedy about tragedy is about the action of noblemen Okay, so it is a representation of action that is worth serious attention. Okay, big things like in Othello, like in maybe Macbeth or uh, or maybe King Lear. Okay, so uh, it is, or even uh, of course uh, many other wonderful plays we have. Tragedy, we have. it's a representation of an action that is worth uh, serious attention. And it's complete. It's complete. It has, of course, uh, a beginning, middle, and an end. It's complete in itself and of some amplitude. Some amplitude. Amplitude refers to the length. It's long enough. There are many incidents. All these incidents are connected. So, it is complete in itself and of some amplitude in language enriched by variety of artistic devices appropriate to the several parts of the play the play say has several parts and what are the parts of uh, the tragedy according to aristotle the tragedy has six parts the plot character diction thoughts spectacle and song so the uh, tragedy is represented in language enriched by a variety of artistic devices figures or speech appropriate uh, uh, to the several parts of the play all right that is for uh, the plot the character thought diction song and spectacle presented in the form of action okay so tragedy is presented in the form of action not narration we saw 
that uh, epic poetry is presented in the form of narration readers can read and enjoy but tragedy is for uh, in fact uh, for performance we have men uh, characters actors on stage so presented in the form of action not narration specifically mentioned there not narration by means of pity and fear and uh, we we see what uh, people do what great men do and the very actions of these great men is inculcating instilling pity and fear in us and uh, we just uh, we, we we go for some kind of a purification or purgation of our emotions and we cry tears stream down our cheeks and this is the very famous description or definition of tragedy and uh, uh, we have of course a slightly different famous definitions like tragedy is an imitation of an action that's serious complete and of uh, significant magnitude depicted with rhythmic language or song in the form of action not narration and uh, produces a purgation of pity and fear in the audience known as catharsis so the greek term catharsis comes to the definition of tragedy in uh, aristotle uh, aristotle's uh, uh, chapter 6 of the poetics description of tragedy now let us in the second part of the chapter uh, aristotle just uh, talk to talks to us about the six parts of tragedy and uh, uh, the, the six parts of tragedy are plot character thought diction song and spectacle and uh, uh, in, in, in this chapter, he goes uh, defining each of the six parts. Okay, so uh, what? let us now look at uh, the definition of uh, each of these uh, parts of uh, tragedy. What is spectacle? The spectacle is an essential part of tragedy because the representation is carried out by men performing the action so spectacle is what you see all right what it is spectacle right spectacular right okay so this is something that is shown right spectacle is an essential part of time because the representation is carried out by men performing the actions right so uh, all the men on stage their words deeds is the spectacle right and number two he speaks about uh, song and diction okay and uh, uh, we know song right uh, there there must be song and diction in uh, a tragedy uh, because they are the medium of representation so this song and diction are the medium of representation that is of course uh, we hear people speak all the thoughts that flash through the mind of the men and women on stage is heard through these two parts of tragedy song and diction and song is of course song right whatever is sung is a song and diction uh, uh, i should says by diction i mean the arrangement of the verses all right so like uh, you have uh, people speaking right so all the words that all the dialogue is diction and the very vocabulary used to uh, just uh, 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 copy the very thoughts and words of people and, and that is diction diction choice of words right and song what is song song is music whatever is sung is music or song all right so now we know uh, spectacle song and diction and uh, thereafter he speaks about the most significant parts of tragedy and that is in tragedy it is action that is uh, imitated and this action is brought about by agents who necessarily display certain distinctive qualities both of character and thought so we have action action is whatever is done on stage so action is caused by or brought about by character that is 
men and women and thoughts the thought right so we have right now character and thought character is of course the actors the men and women and thought is of course the very thought process okay whatever the characters men in action think speak you think something and you speak something right so uh, that together is what is known as character and thought and uh, according to which we define the nature of action right so we have uh, 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 right now spectacle song diction thought and character and now we have of course at last right so the thought and character are then two natural causes of actions and it is on them that all men depend for success or failure the representation of the actions is the plot of the tragedy so we have a lot of incidents taking place so all the incidents taking place together is the plot for the ordered arrangement of the incidents is what i mean by plot so there must be of course uh, a number of incidents and all the incidents are of course well arranged and the arranged uh, 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 well structured arrangement of incidents is what aristotle mean by plot later we have uh, uh, of course the subsequent chapter chapter number 7 uh, and in chapter number 7 we read about uh, the very plot and he speaks to us in detail about plot so uh, uh, what uh, he speaks to us in uh, chapter 6 the description of tragedy is just introducing the term plot and he speaks gives us a vague uh, or basic definition of uh, the plot and he says that uh, the ordered arrangement of incidents is what I mean by plot and later he speaks about character uh, again character on the other hand is that which enables us to define the nature of the participants men and women okay that is uh, character and thought comes out in what they say when they are proving a point or expressing an opinion all right and uh, uh, according to uh, having introduced all these six parts, Aristotle makes a, a very, very important statement that uh, 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 necessarily then every tragedy has six constituents which will determine the quality of the tragedy and the constituent uh, six elements or parts of tragedy are plot, character, diction, thought spectacle song and uh, in this context we uh, we need to remember uh, of course uh, the three uh, important things that uh, we have uh, the media of uh, uh, imitation we have the manner of imitation and we have the object of uh, imitation under the media of imitation we have diction and song under the manner of imitation we have spectacle and under the object of imitation we have plot character and thought okay so now uh, having introduced and defined all the six parts of tragedy aristotle continues to speaks about uh, uh, to speak about of course all this based on its significance and he says that of these six elements the most important is the plot uh, that's why he says that plot is the soul of tragedy the most important is the plot the ordering of the incidents for tragedy is a representation not of men but of action and life of happiness and unhappiness and happiness and unhappiness are bound up with action so plot is the soul of tragedy the incidents and the plot are the end aimed at in tragedy and as always the end is everything okay so the, the the tragedy is very important i mean the plot is very very important and uh, a, a, the success of a tragedy is of course very very crucial and uh, the success uh, depends on the incidents which form the very 
tragedy and all the incidents together is the plot of the tragedy so uh, now another point to note is that the two most important means by which tragedy plays on our feelings are reversals and recognition and aristotle in chapter 6 again speaks to us that uh, these two are very important to uh, just uh, to 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 have an influence on the audience and those two uh, uh, most important means by which the tragedy is playing uh, or influencing our emotions or feelings are reversals and recognitions and he says that reversals and recognitions are the constituent uh, elements or parts of the plot okay so with that uh, 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 he just uh, speaks, uh, he goes to speak to, uh, he begins, in fact, a very prolonged commentary on plot. Uh, and, and, and he says that plot is the first essential of tragedy. It's lifeblood. Plot is the lifeblood of tragedy. And, and, and plot is the first essential of tragedy. It's lifeblood so to speak, and character, the second place. Tragedy is the representation of an action, and it is chiefly an account of the action that is also a representation of persons. And the third property of tragedy, according to Aristotle, is thought. This is the ability to say what is possible and appropriate in any given circumstances. It is what in the speeches in the play it is related to the arts of politics and rhetoric and the older dramatic poets made their characters talk like statesmen whereas those of today make them talk like rhetoricians right and uh, having uh, 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 spoken about plot he uh, uh, just speaks in i mean in in, in cha this chapter again about uh, character so he says that character is that which reveals personal choice character okay actors people men in action they can choose many things okay to be or not to be that's the question whether it's noble in the mind to suffer right so character is that which reveals personal choice the kinds of things a man chooses or rejects when that is not obvious thus there is no revelation of character in speeches in which the speaker shows no preferences or aversions, whatever. Thought, on the other hand, is present in speeches where something is being shown to be true or untrue, where some general opinion is being expressed. Okay, so definition of thought again. And diction. Diction uh, is in fact uh, 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 the... Uh, he says right I told he says right by diction I mean uh, the expressive use of words the expressive use of words and this has the same force in words and in prose okay refers to the use of words diction very simple and music is it is the most important of the pleasurable additions to the play pleasure joy and happiness result from the uh, next element that is music spectacle or stage effect is an attraction of course but uh, it, it refers to of course the technical things spectacle right besides men uh, in action besides actors be, there must be some uh, s s scenery some uh, of course uh, stage property and all the stage property Together uh, is scenery, uh, everything, sound, uh, like uh, all, all that uh, background, sound, uh, light, then um, scenery, all that together is spectacle. Uh, spectacle is stage effect. Uh, it, it is an attraction, of course, but it has the uh, least to do with the playwright's craft or with the art of poetry. For the power of tragedy is independent both of performance and of actors. And besides, the production of the spectacular effects is more the province of the property 
uh, property uh, man than uh, of the playwright okay so with the the comment like uh, uh, that uh, of course uh, the chapter comes to an end uh, that is of course the description of tragedy so in this well, let's just uh, finalize in this chapter chapter 6 Aristotle speaks to us in detail about tragedy he defines tragedy talks to us about the uh, different parts of tragedy he further defines all these parts of tragedy and with that chapter 6 comes comes to an end and uh, this is the end of oh, we have been talking I've been lecturing for almost 45 minutes now so with that we come to the end of uh, this lecture that is lecture number two in this series of lecture on Aristotle of course next day we shall have another lecture in on on the subsequent chapters chapters seven and uh, eight uh, uh, and, and nine in the next uh, video uh, lecture thanks a lot for listening if you find this uh, series of lectures useful please uh, like it you can comment you can ask your questions and uh, uh, please just uh, continue uh, uh, supporting uh, uh, please do subscribe and like the channel thank you everybody may god bless you